Well, good morning. Thank you for coming. I'm Lamar Alexander. This is Congressman Heath Schuler from North Carolina. We are uh, co-chairs of the Tennessee Valley Authority Congressional Caucus, and we'll be joined in a, uh, I'm told right away, by Congressman uh, Lincoln Davis, uh, another member of the caucus. We're delighted he's, he's here. I'd like to ask, uh, I'd like to introduce the witnesses that we have today and and ask them to take their seats because what we're going to do is, the uh, way we're going to proceed is I'm going to make a brief opening statement, then Congressman Shooter will, then Congressman Davis, and then we'll go right to the various witnesses. Uh, the, the witnesses for this forum start with uh, the Tennessee Valley. I guess they're all in place, but uh, I'll, 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 I'll introduce them to begin with. Bill Sansom is here, who's chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority, and Joe Hoagland is here, who uh, Bill will introduce. Uh, when their testimony begins. And Tom Kilgore is also uh, here, who's the CEO of the Tennessee Valley Authority. We thank you all for, for coming. Tom Mason, uh, the director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which has done a lot of work on renewable electricity, renewable energy in general, uh, representing free flow power, Brigadier General Robert Creer and the Chief Executive Dan Irving are here. We welcome both of you. Uh, 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 in all, uh, uh, from uh, North Carolina, uh, do you want to, you want to, Jason Ramsey is here, who's the CEO, Congressman Schuler suggested that they be here, and we welcome you as well. And Marie Eckstein is here, who is the uh, Vice President and the Chief Administrative Officer of, of uh, Dow Corning. They have a big new uh, polysilicon plant in Clarksville, Tennessee, which is uh, making the materials for solar energy and we're delighted they're going to be here and in the audience we also have Mike Chapman who's the chief executive officer of Kelson Energy uh, they make solar they're putting solar cells on their natural gas but Mike if you'd stand up so we can see that you're here thank you for coming uh, putting solar cells on your natural gas plants and you sell electricity to TVA am I correct about that and we're, we're delighted that you're here the way we're going to proceed is uh, uh, as I said, we'll make opening statements, and we like to ask TVA to take uh, 10 minutes on telling us its view of what its choices for renewable electricity are. We'd like for Tom Mason uh, to take 10 minutes uh, giving the view from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and then we'd like each of the others to take five minutes. Now, we've, you've got a lot more than five minutes worth to say, but the reason for that is we want to stay and ask you questions about what you're doing, and we thought that might give us more of a chance to, to learn more about uh, solar power and free, free flow in, in your, your activities. Um, let me begin my remarks, and I'm going to, uh, uh, in a moment, go, go to a, um, a slide presentation as well, but let me just say, this to begin with. Uh, Congress is considering legislation that would require utilities to make 20% of its electricity from a defined group of, of, of sources of renewable electricity. Now, and the President and others have set even higher goals than that. Now, renewable electricity has a lot of different definitions. But generally, it's spoken of as electricity from the sun, the wind, and the earth. Now, my view, this is just my personal view, is that I believe it will be many years before the Tennessee Valley Authority can produce more than 10% of its electricity from the sun, the wind, and the earth. And that if we're not careful, we'll have an energy gap between the renewable energy that we want to have and hope to have someday and the reliable energy we have to have. Um, the Tennessee Valley Authority will tell us about, a, I hope, a, 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 an effort they've made to go into the marketplace to buy renewable electricity um, and how successful that's been. It, it, it didn't get a broad response from many different kinds of, of electricity. Um, at the same time, we need to keep producing large amounts of electricity. I was talking. Uh, with uh, representative one of the two new uh, plants that are producing polysilicon for solar and 
and the one we'll hear from today uh, needs 120 megawatts of electricity each year and expects to use more than that. Well, that's a huge amount of, of electricity. Uh, and I suppose one reason they're here is because TVA can provide uh, large amounts of low-cost, reliable electricity. But today, that comes 60% uh, from, from coal and about 33% uh, from nuclear, 4% from hydroelectric, and 1% from natural gas. So having that supply of electricity is important for all jobs, whether they're red, white, blue, brown, or green jobs. They all, at this stage, need large amounts of low-cost, reliable electricity as clean as possible. Now, today we're going to talk about a variety of kinds of renewable electricity, including some of what I consider to be the most promising. Solar, while it's a very small percentage of what we use today, and while today it costs too much to be competitive compared with other forms of electricity, uh, we all hope is, uh, has great promise for the future. And the governor and the Oak Ridge Laboratory and the two new plants that have just come here, Sharp Electric and Memphis, all uh, are demonstrations of that. We'll hear today from an interesting idea about underwater river turbines. The idea of putting turbines in the Mississippi River creating what I guess would be uh, baseload electricity and selling that to TVA or to other utilities. The, the federal agency that's in charge of this tells me there is a potential for 30,000 megawatts of this sort of electricity in the southeast alone. We could be talking about biomass, which is wood chips. Uh, all those are promising. Uh, in my own view, uh, there are some bad choices that we could make, and one would be uh, wind turbines in Tennessee. They may work well in South Dakota, but I have a picture of here of the size of one on the field where Heath used to play uh, as one of Tennessee's most best and best known athletes. And since the wind blows so little here, and, um, uh, and, and since putting an unbroken line of 500 foot uh, wind turbines from Chattanooga to Bristol would produce about the same amount of electricity as one-fourth of a Watts Bar nuclear plant. You'd still need the nuclear plant because the wind only blows an average of 18 percent of the time in Tennessee, some of it at night when we don't need it. That's not a very good choice for us, and I think we'll be hearing that TVA is finding, is exploring the possibility of buying wind from, from other states. Um, Congressman Schuler and I were talking beforehand about conservation, and, and as we get through the questions, conservation to me is our secret weapon, having more promise in the next few years than most forms of renewable energy. Uh, Tennesseans use our number one in the per capita use of electricity in America. We use 43 percent more than uh, 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 the national average, and if we use the national average, we could avoid building four nuclear plants the size of Watts Bar, five coal plants the size of Bull Run, or nine natural gas plants like the one proposed in Jackson. Or we could give every TVA household the 10 light bulbs, and if they use it, that would be almost as much as Bull Run coal plant or three-fourths of the Watts Bar plant. I think also it's promising to use TVA's unused power at night. Uh, they have enough power at night that would permit us to electrify half our cars and trucks over the next 20 years without building one new plant. Uh, and, and in my view, uh, uh, the Nobel Prize uh, for science ought to be reserved for whoever figures out how to capture carbon from coal plants because we know what to do with the other three pollutants. We haven't figured out what to do with carbon. So this should be a very uh, interesting hearing today. If I could, I have a few slides just to show you the uh, uh, some of the things that we're expecting. Uh, this is the, we can go on to the next slide. Under the federal proposed, hello, Congressman Davis. Mr. Hayes, no, we, sent, Congressman Schuler and I thought you might be riding a mule in. You were, uh, you were riding a mule from, uh, on, on Mule Day, weren't you? I could have hitched my mule east and I could find a place to <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, we're making our introductory remarks and we're going to go to witnesses, so you, you, and I'm finishing up. Uh, under the new law, TVA will have to produce about 670 new megawatts of renewable electricity by 2021. Um, go to the next slide. Now, you can't read all this, but the way, I've, the way our staff has gone through this, we can take the requirement 
then we could assume that DVA would get full benefit for the efficiency factor that's in there, which means it would reduce the amount of renewable electricity that is needed, minus the electricity that TVA is trying to buy now that's renewable. We'll hear more about that. That's about 1,250 megawatts, minus improvements to the uh, dams that TVA has. And by our rough estimates, uh, TVA will need that many kilowatts of renewable electricity 10 years from now, which is equivalent to about 670 new megawatts, which is a little less than the Bull Run coal plant or about two-thirds of, or about half of a new nuclear plant. Right, next. So the amendment that I'm going to offer in the Senate would give TVA credit for the renewable electricity uh, uh, for the nuclear power it produces. I think it's important to remember that if our objective is clean energy, that nuclear power produces 70% of our energy that's free of carbon, mercury, uh, nitrogen, and sulfur. And so if my amendment were to be adopted, that would reduce the requirement on TVA to about 266 megawatts. Next. Now, TVA would have, how would, where would TVA get 266 megawatts more of renewable electricity by 2021? Well, if it built four new 1,200 megawatt nuclear plants, the amount of credit it would get would equal 266. Or it'd be 630 football fields of solar panels. Or I think what we'll hear today is that the underwater turbines in the Mississippi River near Memphis, uh, if they work as advertised, could produce that much. Or we might build three biomass power plants, that's wood chips, the southern company south of here is going to build uh, one in the near term. Or going to the next slide, it, uh, we could build dams that would produce the electricity of Watts Bar and Fort Loudon combined. That's very unlikely. We don't have any rivers left to do that on. Or 985 of these wind turbines in an unbroken line from Chattanooga, Bristol, to Bristol would produce that much. Or 385 wind turbines in South Dakota where the wind blows more. These are what the wind turbines would look like. This, this is what they look like in Maine. In my view, a bad choice. Uh, here's another example. Uh, this is from the Appalachian Trail in Maine. And another example, this is the actual size uh, of one in Nalen Stadium. They're three times as tall as the skyboxes there, and the blades are as wide as the football field. And I'd like for you to imagine an unbroken line of those from Chattanooga to Bristol and, and, and how that would destroy the environment in the name of saving the environment. Finally, Another choice, if we couldn't do all the other things that we just talked about, was we'd have to basically pay the government for $70 million of renewable electricity credits every year. That would be money flowing out of the Tennessee Valley. And instead, uh, the final slide, uh, well, the, the, the cost has to be a factor uh, in all of this. In December, 30,000 Nashvillians said they couldn't pay their bills. And now the final slide is about conservation, as I mentioned. Tennessee is number one in electricity use per capita. Um, that's the easiest, quickest place to go to have clean electricity, uh, clean electricity here. Uh, or another way to, to say it is we spend about $60 million on the Buffalo Mount, TVA's Buffalo Mountain Wind Farm. Uh, it produces about five megawatts of electricity a year. If we took that $60 million, we could buy uh, everybody in the TVA region five light bulbs, fluorescent light bulbs, and if they use them, it would be the same as 920 megawatts of power. So the $60 million, instead of producing five megawatts of intermittent power, could in effect produce 920 megawatts of, of baseload power. That's as much as Bull Run Coal Plant is, produces it's nearly as much as the Watt Bar, Watts Bar plant produces. So you can see there are many things to consider here. I'll now ask Congressman Schuler and Congressman Davis to make their remarks, and then we'll look forward to what the witnesses have to say. Thank you, Senator. Um, you would almost think that we had uh, collaborated on some of the talking points uh, between our offices when we talk about conservation. Um, this last week I had an opportunity to, to meet with a gentleman who has spent his entire life uh, in the engineering field of building and construction. The United States, 40% of the electric, electricity use 
or consumption of petroleum, natural gas, and others is spent on our buildings. We had a, con a conversation about what can we do. You know, we're obviously putting scrubbers on on our coal burning plants, which is a was really good. It helps, but uh, I guess, and hopefully, it'll be a question I'll get to ask. Is I think that's that they use 10% of the, the the plant's consumption of energy is based upon uh, uh, operating the scrubbers. So we went to a, a, a complete uh, uh, conversation about what can we do. Um, in our area, they're looking at putting a, a, a coal burning plant in our area. The cost of that coal burning plant, even though it would have scrubbers, it would lessen some of the, uh, the greenhouse gases. If we were just to take the cost of that coal burning plant and give, it would allow every single family, every home in the state of North Carolina, $5,000 that that they can in return now on occasions uh, our opponents were able to kick and punt the ball very well so at times maybe that wind turbine would have been good in the stadium <laughs> but for lack of better use of words window strips new windows and insulations not sexy solar panels wind turbines all of these other renewables are but if we were to just take the amount of energy that we use or that we may need in the entire United States and, and be able to produce the amount of jobs by replacing windows, putting insulation, weather stripping in, we can lessen in the entire United States 300 coal burning plants and be able to pr produce millions of jobs for people to to put new windows in homes, manufacture these windows in the United States. I was recently out in South Texas and I saw one of the wind turbine farms and it was great. I mean, I was blown away. Wind was blowing the entire time, 400 feet from the, the base to the top. The, the turbine itself, turbine itself was imported from Japan the blades was imported from from Mexico and I understand we have one now in Chattanooga that the, actually the the tower itself but their towers were actually imported from Korea so I asked the gentleman over the project I said, what does the United States get out of this he said I don't know because the Australians own it <laughs> he said maybe a little gravel a little rock to pour the concrete we have an opportunity moving forward and when you have members of congress as as my two friends here lincoln davis and senator lamar alexander when we can look at conservation and how we can produce jobs we can less our greenhouse admissions for the next generation i mean people come to east tennessee and west north carolina to see the mountains and folks if it gets to the point that we can't see those mountains people will not show up so we have to make a commitment I think you have three members here along with a, a lot of our other colleagues that's willing to make a, a commitment to lessen the greenhouse emissions. And we can do that so easily and produce jobs through efficiency and do all of the other things that's necessary, the solar in parts of the United States that it fit, the wind in parts of the United States, the underwater turbines. We can do that if we work together. And so I think you have a a commitment to, to a lot of us that are willing to do this. I have young children. I don't want to them to have to pay for the things that's already been placed upon them and the burdens that's been placed upon them already. I don't want that to have an, a long lasting impact. We're seeing how climate change has, has certainly made an impact in, in the, the amount of increase in asthma in children. We look at the skin cancer. So we've got to make this turn, we've got to make these changes as quickly as we possibly can, but we have to do it in a way that is sound, it's been vetted, and that's part of our discussion today is how we can do it most effectively. And we can get it done right the first time, that we don't have to go back and fix problems and issues by passing legislation that we've seen in, in years past, that just passing legislation because it sounds good and looks good on paper. 
how will it impact our ratepayers? How will it impact our families, their economy, and so forth? So, Senator, thank you for uh, and your staff for putting this um, um, this hearing together today. And uh, to uh, to my good friend Lincoln, uh, thank you for your commitment and uh, and all that you've done in, in in the House. Thank you, Congressman Lincoln Davis. Welcome. Senator, thanks, and to my friend Heath Schuler from North Carolina, we kind of claim you in Tennessee as well, but it's certainly good to be here, and uh, Chairman Sansom, it's good to see you here as well, as those on the panel who will be uh, engaged in conversation over the next probably couple of hours. I'm not sure how long that I will have, probably n no more than an hour, so I, I, I may not have an opportunity to ask some of the questions that, that I would like to, but I want to make a few comments that that as I've traveled my district that I represent, not mine, but the people's district that I represent, Tennessee has 40,000 square miles. The district I represent has 10,000 of those. 95 counties, I have 24 of those counties. I have the fourth most rural residential congressional district in the country and the third highest number of blue collar workers. As we engage in this conversation about an energy policy for this nation that will make us self-sustainable, I think everything has to be on the table, everything. As I travel the district, I heard many, many folks take opposition to climate change or global warming. I heard some who said it's a certainty. And so as I travel the district, I had to somehow diffuse that issue because it has become left wing and right wing. The ideologues are taking positions on this and therefore, if there's enough flack, we will never be able to have an energy policy that will make us energy independent or close to that. And so my comment was this to them. Let's drop the labels of whether it's climate change or global warming. It's economic security. And folks sitting in the room when I said, if you paid $4 a gallon last year for gasoline, what did your children have to do without? What did you eat? Because if you drove to work in the district I represent, you probably spent 8 or $10 driving to work. And so that money, because of the increase, meant that you had to deny your children, yourself, or maybe even your family, a place to live. So from my standpoint, it's economic security. We can debate the issues that become ideologically tilted and never achieve anything in this country. We're seeing that happen right now. It has to stop, especially when it comes to energy. And it's national security. And if you don't believe that, why do you think we're in certain parts of the world today? So economic security and national security are the reasons that we ought to be engaged. It's okay to talk about climate change and global warming. I've been to the South Pole, I agree. In my opinion, it's happening. I just took a trip to the North Pole and got on the nuclear sub. We have about 70 of those, not nuclear subs, but 70 vessels in, this, in our arsenal, in our Navy, that has a nuclear reactor on those. 365 feet long, there's an attack sub. I came off that submarine and I was not glowing in the dark. And I'm still not very bright from what some folks would say. But the point I'm making is this. When we look at the sources we have today for energy that we need for our working families in the district I represent, to increase their cost 50 or 75 or 100 percent is unsustainable for them. So as we look at a sustainable energy policy, we better consider every option we have, including clean coal nuclear energy. We have the Department of Energy that currently exists and has done, in my opinion, a lot of research and will continue to in Oak Ridge at the Oak Ridge National Lab at Y-12. There's a possibility that through the processes being developed there now and as we look at other research that we can reduce dramatically the actual waste for the spent nuclear rods that we have. So as we engage in this, let's realize where we get our energy from today, almost 50% from coal, 20% from nuclear energy, and roughly 25% from natural gas. That leaves us about 5 or 6% that we produce from all these sources that all of a sudden are going to produce us all the energy we need. But that's a challenge ahead of us. I'll give you one brief example and then we'll go into the other testimonies. I built a house in 1978 in a small town called Birdstown, Tennessee. We raised our daughters there, they were educated there. Unfortunately, because of job opportunities, they now live someplace else, and I have to spend a lot of time on the road going to see my five grandchildren. We built a house in 78. We had a split unit, electric unit. 
had the air handler and the heat unit inside. We had outside the compressor as well as the heat pump. And we decided since natural gas came there about 20 years ago, we would switch to natural gas. We did that, but the wells that supplied Birdstown ran out. And so we put a propane tank in. We were paying close to $2,000 a month in the winters buying fuel for that heating system. A year ago, last December, we bought an electric unit, set it outside the house rather than a split unit, and we now are saving probably, we're paying probably a third of what our energy bill. Efficiency is part of that. That becomes conservation. And so from my standpoint, that's just one little small issue. Putting fluorescent bulbs, my wife doesn't buy these incandescent lights anymore. She buys fluorescent bulbs and she's made us do that same thing in our apartment. Heath, you've been there. We have I've cut almost by a third our energy costs just by changing bulbs in our home, our apartment in Washington where we stay two or three nights a week. So as we engage in this debate, there has to be common sense applied in how we find all the different options that will make America self-sustainable. And common sense to me is this. It's the application of a person's knowledge based upon their experiences in life. We've experienced a lot in, in the Tennessee Valley. We've experienced a lot through TVA. We've had some headaches, some heartaches. As a matter of fact, some very big disappointments. We're going through some of those now. But we can fix it because we're Americans. And we will only fix it through science, technology, and through applying common sense as we engage in that. Senator Alexander, thank you, and, and uh, Heath Schuler for your leadership as co-chairs of the caucus. For those of us who serve, I want to say this about our delegation. We have nine members of the House and two members in the Senate. Our chiefs of staff have been meeting now for the last several years, almost weekly, to talk about issues in Tennessee. We have a good bipartisan effort in Washington. I just wish that we could have the same thing across the borders and the different states of this nation that we have in this state. And we're glad to welcome Heath from North Carolina, about the same cooperation there as well, but certainly it's good to see both of you here and thanks for the work that each of you are doing to make the Tennessee Valley a better place to live and one that would not be so expensive that we can't stay here. Thank you, Congressman Davis and Congressman Schuler. Now we'll, I've already introduced the witnesses and so we'll go right to them and then if you're still here, Lincoln, why you can ask the first questions. If you're not, we appreciate your statement. Uh, Bill Sansom, Chairman of TVA. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for inviting TVA to be part of this uh, uh, discussion today on renewable and conservation and appreciate y'all's interest. I know many times we've met in Washington and discussed all these issues and we appreciate y'all's leadership and both uh, with TVA and our energy future in the country. So thank y'all for what you're doing and for being here today. And Heath, I remember when you played over you were about that tall. <laughs> so glad you can come back and see the stadium here. So thanks for coming back. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what TVA is doing and Lamar, I think you covered a lot of our territory already today, so I'll cut some of this short. Um, but about a year ago, uh, actually in May a year ago, we started working on a comprehensive energy efficiency plan, and what all of y'all are speaking about. And uh, and in fact, this guy was the first guy, Joe was the first guy to start trying to carry that out in TVA and start seeing what we could do on conservation. Uh, and, then, and also, we were trying to do um, look into renewables and what we could do with renewables. We had hearings all across the Tennessee Valley and to discuss these issues and had a lot of input. And so we included all that in our strategic plan at that, that time. Um, I might, uh, Lamar, what you talked about, we, right now about 1% of our energy comes from uh, renewables. Um, and about 35% of our generation is zero, zero carbon energy. And that, of course, includes nuclear and our, our hydro energy. Um, so what we did, we decided to go out and try to find out what renewable energy sources we, we had, how much in the valley, how much out of the valley, and so that's what we've been working on for about a year. And we've, we've gotten about 60 proposals in on renewable energy. Um, 
a little bit of biomass in Tennessee, but everything basically is outside the state of Tennessee. Um, and Joe will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we were out seeking 2,000 megawatts. Uh, uh, I know when we had our board meeting in Johnson City about two weeks ago, uh, Senator Alexander was quick to call me and say he was had seen some of that, and we were talking about this 2,000 megawatts, and, and I think what he pointed out is, is important is the capacity factor of this and how much of it really we can depend on when we need the energy is important because we made the comment 2,000 megawatts comparing it to a, a 1,200 megawatt nuclear plant and what Mark clearly points out that they're apples and oranges and we can't count on that 2,000 megawatts because it's only varies from 28% to say 40% capacity factor. 